All right, everybody, welcome back to the Flipping Junkie podcast. I'm really excited today to be talking with Rod Wilson. How's it going, Rod? Good, how are you doing? Great. Yeah, so we wanted to, to get on here and talk. We've been chatting a little bit uh, before this, uh, mostly about diet and exercise, but uh, we, we won't be, <laughs> be talking about that as much uh, in this episode, and I'm sure you guys would be glad about that. But uh, you know, what I wanted to cover in this is, is Rod is is brilliant with what he does and with the changes in in the market and and things like that i think for lending you know a lot of the investors out there looking for money to do these deals are questioning what's happening with that what's going on with that how can uh, i adjust to make sure that i'm still being able to get funding for my deals and all that kind of stuff so i'd love to to talk about that with you today rod and just to start in case anybody hasn't heard of you before would you like to give your background and how you got into real estate and everything that you currently do? Sure. Yeah, I was just thinking we we got to start another podcast called uh, Health Junkie. Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. We, we like can talk that. about health and fitness stuff. That was that was fun. Um, yeah. So my background, um, you know, out of college, I I started actually doing mortgages, which is kind of funny. I've gone full circle doing lending again, but um, I was doing conventional mortgages. Always had an interest in real estate. When I got out of college, first thing I did was went and flipped a house. Um, I tell the story where I think I, if I, you know, netted the thing out as far as what I made per hour is probably like, you know, minimum wage because uh, I did everything myself. My my buddy and I basically did everything. So that was kind of the cutting our teeth and, you know, just doing our first flip. And then um, in the 90s, I was primarily focused on buy and hold. I was, uh, you know, just trying to buy a, a property or two a year. Um, early two thousands, I, uh, got back into flipping. I did, you know, a, a, a project with another buddy and, um, you know, just did very well on it. And I have these handful of rentals that are making, you know, maybe netting a couple hundred bucks a month each or a few hundred bucks a month. And then I did one flip and then, you know, I'm putting a hundred, 150 K in my pocket. So nice. end up kind of selling out of the, uh, the buy and hold stuff and just really got the, the flipping. And then that turned into um, land development went out to, um, Idaho and, in, in kind of a big way, um, which was great at first. Um, it's just, it, I, I've got scars from going through, you know, 2008, we were primarily doing land development, had some commercial projects and, uh, went and bought a shopping mall. I mean, we were just, you know, it was kind of the wild west, early 2000s out there. And it was, a, I don't know if you've been out to the treasure Valley near in, in Boise, but, it's just this very cool market. Um, and anyway, um, not to not to go too deep on it, but um, yeah, we we basically just, you know, couldn't get out of stuff fast enough, um, you know, land development. It's just, it was slow and had some issues with weather and various things, you know, it was, it, it turned out it was like one of the wettest springs and then one of the, the coldest winters. So just, you know, cutting pads and doing stuff like that when it's, you know, zero basically um, was just challenging. So anyway, end up kind of licking my wounds and and started uh, fixing flipping probably in the 11, 12, you know, 2011, 2012, something like that. Yeah, things um, started improving again about that time, right? Yeah, exactly. It was just, you know, kind of coming off the 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 low. In fact, I, I think the low was right in that that zone as far as uh, real estate values. And so primarily was doing fix and flipping. And then um, a buddy of mine um, took over as CEO of, of Anchor Loans. And, you know, we were actually acquired by a company called Predium, who's uh, about a $40 billion asset uh, management company, real estate asset management company. And um, he's like, you, you got to come over here. We're doing some good things. Um, I was kind of slow from a, a development perspective. And I don't know, it just kind of made sense. I like the idea of, you know, uh, the lending side of the business. Um, it allows me to, you know, when you're when you're doing real estate, you know, and you're, you're always looking for another deal. If you're not, you know, if you're not actively doing deals, um, you're not making any money. And so, you know things kind of got a little bit slow. I was primarily focused in the Bay area and then, um, so made the move to lending and and here I am. Awesome. Yeah. I want to dig into how you operate and what, 
you know, what, what I'm sure you, you guys are having meetings, you guys are looking at data, you're seeing what the markets are doing. Um, how, what is, what are the conversations like for you right now, as far as that goes, are there markets you're keeping an eye on and you kind of, you know, we're not going to do anything here for a little bit or, you know, what, what is that like right now? What's going on with all of that? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually I've, I've, uh, it's funny, I've, I've tried to get my capital markets guy on my podcast before, and he's a little reluctant to, to, you know, share all the, the goodies, but um, yeah. So from, uh, you know, protecting the company, obviously the mar there's market shift and, you know, we pretty much do this all the time anyway. And it's even more important now that we're, you know, in this kind of shifting um, downward trending market. Um, so we, we do look at basically every we're in, we're in 48 States. So we uh, analyze pretty much every major MSA. Um, and he does kind of a heat map on, you know, where they're at based on, you know, the various numbers. And so um, they, um, they kind of come back with, you know, where there, there are some off, um, off limits markets that we are not lending in. But for the most part, it kind of gives us an idea and we dictate leverage and pricing based on, you know, this heat map. So some of the markets that are, you know, seeing like, you know, significant declines, not only are we a little, you know, careful as far as values and whatnot, but also, um, you know, just from a risk perspective, they tend to be a little higher risk. And so that'll dictate margin. So there are, there are, you know, a handful of markets will, will reduce um, leverage. We keep, you know, we keep lending. Um, I mean, that's been the nice thing about um, being with Anchor because so many lenders have had a lot of challenges during these, you know, first we saw the kind of interest rates, you know, going crazy. And then we saw the market shift. So, you know, those two factors are obviously pretty tough on, on this business. Um, and so, but, you know, given the the backing of, of Pretium, who's our parent company, um, you know, they're, they're kind of staying power and wherewithal. Not only are we able to, you know, continue operating, but we're still, I, I think, pretty aggressive, you know, pretty, um, as far as rates and leverage, um, still, you know, providing, I think a really competitive, um, you know, pricing for our, for our borrowers. But, um, yeah, so I think, you know, outside of just the heat map and determining kind of what markets are, are hot, I think in general, most lenders, um, you know, we've seen rates go up obviously. And then also, um, fairly recent, we've seen leverage, uh, being reduced. So, you know, from, uh, you know, where's the, the trend? I mean, um, we just had a discussion the other day about this. When the market was super hot, we got, we, and I would say the lending, you know, the private money lending or hard money lending community got pretty aggressive. So, you know, you were seeing like 100% financing, you know, maybe 90, 90, 100, 90% leverage at, at acquisition, and then 100% of the, the rehab funds. You know, that was pretty common, even for maybe not the most experienced borrower, because you know, the market was kind of going up and to the right. And, you know, the risk was relatively low, even if someone took longer or maybe didn't do a great job at the, you know, whether it's a ground up build or, or rehab, um, you know, time was almost on your side, right? Yeah. So, you know, yeah, it's all set by the increase in values, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you got, it's not really a mistake, for, you know, but exactly. Yeah, so a lot of guys got bailed out or, or, you know, benefited from, you know, taking longer. And so we've just, you know, totally flipped that, right? It's like the longer you take, you know, in a, in a downward trending market, I mean, it it, it gets uh, painful. So do you, um, you also get, I mean, I don't know how much of this you can get into, but within the markets themselves, are there price ranges and brackets of price ranges that you look at that get treated differently, or is it all kind of lumped into one market being a little bit more risk? It's um, that's a great question. I, I don't have a good answer for that, to be honest. I um, I'm sure they do look at, you know, the amounts, uh, dollar amounts. Um, primarily it's, it's, you know, kind of market specific, you know, we'll do, I mean, our, our, our minimum for the most part is about hundred K and then we'll go up to 10 million bucks. And so, you know, as a, if you're looking at a market in, you know, Brentwood and in, in, you know, Southern California, I mean, you know, we're doing three, five, you know, $7 million deals out there. Is that a higher risk than, 
you know, something in Missouri for a hundred K. I mean, it it just, yeah, it just kind of depends on the product type and the, um, and, and we, I guess maybe transitioning to the second thing we look at is, you know, the individual, actually it's, it's more of the first thing we look at is everyone I talk to. I mean, I want to find out what the credit is and what the experience is, because this, that's really what we focus on. And obviously the, you always want, you know, the highest possible credit. Um, and, And I'm amazed at, I mean, I've, I've been there uh, as far as like, you know, letting your your credit, not necessarily because of lates, but just because of inquiries and, you know, mm-hmm. how much debt you have out, you know, you can get, you can get kind of beat up on the, uh, the credit score. But um, yeah, so we'll look, you know, closely at that. And, you know, I, I'm always recommending people that are kind of in the, the sixes, just getting kind of in the sevens, because it, it's, it's a big deal as far as, you know, rate and points in most cases. And then, um Related to experience, it's what I like to to tell people is don't leave the experience to chance. Like we will go and verify and most lenders will go and, you know, verify your past experience just to see, you know, make sure you kind of do what you say you're going to do. But I would, I recommend people go one step further and, and really kind of tell the story and provide all that data, not only just, you know, addresses, but like, you know, what'd you do? You know, um, what was the level of the construction of the rehab? You know, what was your buy? What was your sell? Even, you know, profit info, if, if you're willing to, to share that, because that to me shows success versus just a project and, and also being able to work through challenges. I mean, no, you know, well, rarely is a project, you know, you don't run into some kind of challenge or surprise, and so telling that story, it's almost like, you know, going and, and getting a job. I mean, the more you can tell about how you've dealt with, you know, adverse situations is, is always what an underwriter wants to see because, you know, mm-hmm. we've been doing loans at, at Anchor or Anchor has been doing loans for 25 plus years. I mean, we, I think they've seen like every scenario. No, I'm and sure. so it's like, like all stay right, the commercials. Exactly. Or they've seen everything, you know, but that's right. Yeah. So it it rarely, in fact, sometimes they'll come back with some guideline or something and I'll, I'll basically question it. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm, I relatively new in lending. So, you know, I'm, I feel like I see the world more from an investor or developer side, not a lender. So I, I kind of drive them crazy. Um, cause usually I'm, you know, going to bat for my borrowers and trying to explain, you know, why this is a, a good credit risk, but they'll come back and it seems like nine times out of 10, they'll have some crazy scenario that they had to deal with, you know, five, 10 years ago that, that yeah. didn't work out real well. So. Yeah. And, you know, you, there's two ways to look at, you know, a lender's looking at your, your, the level of risk that they they will be accepting and giving and doing the loan. You know, one is that, you know, that really stinks. Um, I'm going to have to prove all this stuff. And, uh, and jump through these hoops and things like that. But the other side, the other way to look at that, I think from just my experience in the past was, you know, especially with like a mentor or somebody that, you know, where, where I was splitting deals with somebody in the very beginning, they kept me out of trouble a lot. You know, where it's like, if they don't think this is a good deal, it's probably not a good deal. Like I should not be doing this deal. And so, you know, do you find that that happens sometimes when you, when you, you know, get an application that you kind of just say, Hey, this isn't going to work out. And then the people are like, uh, maybe I shouldn't do this deal. Uh, absolutely. No, I, I mean, I, that's where I think a little bit of what I bring to the table versus just the average, uh, you know, lender is just, I, I feel like I've maybe not seen it all, but I've seen a lot, you know, as far as what works and what doesn't. And, and just, you know, I've got the, you know, the scars or the stripes, whatever you want to call it to prove it. But what you just said, Danny is such a huge nugget right there. For anyone who's either, you know, a total newbie or, you know, relatively new in the business. And this is one of the things, because we we have a, a minimum where you've had to have had, um, done three prior projects before we'll lend to you. Uh, we focus primarily on, you know, experienced guys. But um, I all the time I'll get either new or, or relatively new um, operators or investors that will come to us and I just, I, I'm like, you know, do yourself a favor, give up a, a piece of the pie and just get someone who's got the experience to walk you through these. Cause there are so many things that you, you know, you think, you know, and, and you just don't, and you don't, you don't, you don't know them or you won't know them until you go through that situation. And, 
I, I've been through plenty of uh, of painful situations where, you know, just little things where an experienced, you know, developer would have would have said, hey, that's not going to work, you know? Right. And it's really not that hard to do. And of course, you know, you hear somebody saying that that's been through it and it's like, oh, it's easy for you to say that. I'm, that's not what I'm experiencing. I'm having a hard time finding somebody that's going to, you know, help me through these deals. But, you know, the the way to do it, if in, anybody listening to others probably heard this, but if you haven't heard this, it could help you a lot. And maybe anybody that's heard it, but but hasn't believed it. It's really about, you know, don't go looking for the person, right? You go and you find a pretty good deal and then you go look for the person because they're interested in the deal, not you or just helping you for nothing or, you know, or helping you learn the basics that you can learn on your own online with everything that's available nowadays. Um, if you if you are getting some calls from likely motivated sellers and then you go to a RIA meeting and you talk to people who who's... Who here has mentored other people or who here has been around for a long time? And you just go and talk to them and say, I got this lead for this house. Here are the numbers. They're going to look at it, right? Because there's potential to make money. Right. Right. And, and if you show that you're a go-getter and you're bringing them leads on a regular basis, they're going to, that that's going to develop that friendship, that relationship, right? It's not a, let me go talk to this person and not bring anything to the table other than my interest in it, which everybody's got the interest, Right. Right. You have to have something else there that's showing that you not only have the interest, but have the ability to go out there and make things happen and get these leads in. Yeah, no, right. there's so much, there's so many advantages because it's if you get and if they're willing to sign on, you know, on the debt, if you're if you're getting debt, um, I mean, just them being, you know, the signer or one of the signers can usually improve the pricing to where I guess they almost end up paying for themselves and you know, doing the right project uh, where maybe you should have passed and, uh, you know, they're, they're showing you why, um, you know, there's the pricing because they're, you know, just a better credit risk. They're going to qualify and get, you know, better pricing, better leverage. And um, what, there was another one I was just thinking of. They, um, anyway, I lost my train of thought, but they, right. you know, there's a lot of advantages on bringing in a good partner. You know, it's just, you, you, you don't want to be out there on your own, you know, I mean, you know, even, even, uh, you know, experienced uh, investors, you know, fix and flippers, you know, they'll come across a, a land deal and they'll, you know, want to go take it down. And there's all these gotchas that, you know, on doing a, an entitlement deal that you would just never know about. I mean, I've done this before. I've brought buddies in that, you know, do this for a living. And, you know, there's all these things that I just, I thought, you know, I thought I knew and I really didn't. And they, you mm -hmm. know, kind of saved my, saved my butt in some cases. Yeah. I just got a call yesterday for 27 acres near San Antonio, which is where I'm at. And uh, I was kind of excited at first about it. And then, you know, after talking to a couple of people, I was like, you know what, this isn't really my cup of tea. I'm going to, I'm going to sell this lead off to, you know, somebody else. And if they do it, great, you know, make some money. I'll make a little bit of money for the lead, but, you know, stay out of that. But getting back into the lending part of it, because I think, um, you know, anybody out there that that's maybe done that, right, started with with a, um, a partner or started with a, a mentor that was covering the cost and they were splitting everything half and half, which I like that set up a lot. But after a year or so, when you've really learned the ropes and you've done well, they've made good money, you start thinking, I really want to start doing more on my own. Right. And I think that conversation needs to be had with them. You don't just one day tell them, hey, I'm doing this on my own now, laters, because, you know, there, there's a relationship there. But right. Um, but but, you know, talking with them about your plans to do that and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, you know, and then looking into, OK, so I'm going to need to get the funding for this. What is this going to cost me? What is this? You know, I was giving up half of the deal. So even with, you know, some hard money. I'm probably going to be making more overall, right? But, and all that kind of stuff. How, it, so what I would be thinking is how can I find the best financing? Like, how can I, I get the best financing? Do you have any tips on anybody to find the better financing? Yeah, no. So um, the one thing that you had just mentioned, I mean, there's, you know, the two two things I, I mentioned as far as, you know, getting good financing, competitive financing, it's it's credit and experience. And with experience, I mean, every lender's different, but I, I made a huge mistake um, where I had a, a, a buddy that, 
we were, um, we had been kind of working together. I, he was more commercial. I was doing residential. He wanted to come together. He had all these investors and money and whatnot that he wanted to um, deploy on the residential side. So we came together. He created an entity or had an entity and we started operating and buying under that entity. And he was, he, you know, he basically told me, um, you know, I'm going to add you to the entity, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, it's like months. And then it turned out years go by, you know, we do 15, 20 deals and I never end, you know, ended up on the entity. And then we kind of went our separate ways. And then here I am, I, you know, done 15, 20 deals over the last two, three years and had basically nothing to show for it. There was not a, you know, cause I got paid out through, you know, internally through the company that I didn't really have anything to attach me to that experience. Hmm. So um, it depends on the lender. So, um, you know, we will definitely want to verify and look at, you know, addresses and tie whatever entity owned the property and did the project back to, you know, the individual borrower. But um, I guess just as far as like thinking ahead, you just want to be able to attach yourself to a project, whether it's, you know, you're on the HUD and you're getting paid out a, a fee or you're part of that company, just, and I recommend people do this all the time, is just make sure that there's a way to, you know, a paper trail showing that you were tied to that project. And the more, the better. I mean, if you can show that you were, you know, project managing, I mean, you know, wholesaling a deal, it's really not going to get you much, you know, much juice as far as experience. But um, yeah, if you were like managing it, you found it, you, you know, were involved in the sale of it, whatever your, you know, your, your role was, you just want to be able to show that because then um, a lender is going to look at that and say, okay, well, you know, maybe it's not his entity and, you know, he wasn't on title himself, but he did get paid out on these, you know, five or 10 or however many deals. And, um, you know, or he was the guy that, that found it and managed it so um, it, it sounds like, you know, kind of a pain. It sounds like, you know, you know, why do you want to spend the time on doing that? It is absolutely huge because when it comes down to getting financing, um, you know, rate points, you know, leverage, you know, mm -hmm. term, all, all the terms related to the financing um, from little to no experience to, you know, a decent to a lot of experience, it's, it's, it's huge, huge difference. Yeah, that's a great thousands point that you thousands of dollars. Yeah, that's a great point that you brought up, and and that's like one of those things where you go through it without knowing what you just said, and then that's the thing that you're thinking. I wish I would have known that before I did all those deals, right? It's like had right had a way to show that that, and and one of those ways is you know if even if you are getting a mentor or somebody that's putting up the money and you guys are splitting things it could still be a property bought in your name and they're the lender, right? They lend on it and secured by that property. Um, if that's something that they will do, that's a great way to do it because then you do have ownership of that property and you do go through all the, you know, the, the fix up and, and then selling it. And you have the HUDs to show that you or your entity uh, purchased it and sold it. Right. Right. Yeah. So so those are the ways to get the, you know, to, to be able to show the experience one and then the credit showing that you're good with money. You're not going to go and buy some fancy car and start posting on, you know, TikTok or whatever, you, <laughs> you're, you're a baller already or whatever, you know, all this kind of stuff. But um, anyway, kind of showing my age by talking like that, but. No, um, that's, that's funny. That's so true. You get, get a picture next to a jet and, you know, right. <laughs> try and get some followers. Yeah, the other the other thing I, I guess I'll throw in there, you know, related to that is, um, well, I, I always and I, I do these little quick tips, and one of them is, you know, tell your story. And I recommend because I ended up having to do this. You know, you're busy. The last thing you want to do is like stop, you know, spend a half day or a day or a couple of days. You know, um, look, you know, pulling all your HUDs, you know, getting all the address info, the numbers, the the you know what you did to the project, um, past project. So I'm always recommending people just, you know, take a day off. I actually, um, I went and just got out of my office and just sat there for probably, you know, I don't know, four or six hours and just kind of went through each one of my past projects, got the numbers together. And then I told the little story, you know, what'd we do? We moved walls, we added footage, blah, blah, blah. So the more you can tell your story, the better. Um, the other is related to the actual project you're doing. You know, a lot of guys will just say, yeah, it's fix and flip, 
um, you know, we're going to add 200 feet, blah, 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 whatever. Um, talking about the strategy and why you're doing certain things also goes a long way. And I know it's time consuming and, it, you know, you, most guys just want to, you know, kind of send over the, the bare minimum and try and get funded. But the more you can tell the story of the deal and your game plan related to it or your strategy, that's what underwriters, they don't like unknowns. So, you know, they'll, you get a purchase, you know, contract, which is the purchase price, you get your rehab budget. And that's where most, you know, most investors or most uh, fix and flippers will stop. And so I'm always, you know, I'm either telling the story for them after a phone call, or I'm telling them, you know, give us some more detail, you know, what, what kind of pool are you putting in and why? And, um, you know, you're, instead of, you know, having this particular layout, you're going to open these walls and have kind of an open, you know, modern floor plan, you know, so um, it, it seems like it's, you know, is it really worth it? Is it going to get me, you know, more? But again, I go back to underwriters. They don't, if there's, you know, questions or uncertainty or there, there's something that they don't have the, you know, kind of the backup data on. Um, in general, I mean, I think that kind of makes them nervous and it's just, it's harder to get, you know, a deal approved or get the pricing you want. Yeah. And I think that goes, that gets into this idea of, you know, people running their real estate investing business as if it's a hobby versus a true business, right? And that's a huge thing because so many people do get into this business to get rich quick, right? I mean, it's it's just something, you know, they want financial freedom, all that kind of stuff. And, and I, you know, I got into it for that same reason. I was like, this is awesome. You know, it's like all this opportunity here and all this kind of thing. But at the end of the day, if you're if you're trying to do this as like a side hustle or something that you just want to do these quick things and then just move on and make this money, you're kind of missing out on how you're operating that as a business and it's not going to last very long and it's not going to be as profitable as, as it can be. And based on what you were just talking about, that kind of shows you who who is operating this thing as just something that they're hoping to profit from and don't really care too much. Right. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. No, you're, you're, you, you nailed it. In fact, I think, you know, most of us are guilty of, of doing that. You know, you, you just, you get busy, you get focused on whether, whatever it is, deal flow or managing projects or, or all the above, but um, yeah, taking, you know, taking these little pauses to, you know, and th that's, that actually brings up another point is, you know, I, I, I deal with this all day long, every day, but you can definitely tell the ones that are treating this like a professional business and the ones that are, you know, either maybe it's a professional business, but they're kind of winging it um, and just how organized you are. And that's, you know, they don't really teach organization in, in school. You know, that's one of those things. It's kind of like, you know, personal finance. They just don't teach it. They don't teach you how to, you know, keep your files in order and stuff like that. But um, and, and this goes back to, you know, just the whole, you know, overall strategy of, of what I try to, you know, um, give my borrowers and clients is, you know, I want to be able to get these loans turned around quickly. So you could write, you know, more aggressive offers and, you know, get started on a project. I mean, you know, time is, is money. Right. Um, and so it's just, it's huge being organized and, you know, there's stuff that comes up. We don't, we don't, I don't know everything that I, uh, you know, that the underwriter is going to ask for, but, you know, some borrowers, it's like, Hey, I need, you know, this resolution for this entity. And then boom, it's, it's, it's in my inbox, you know, an hour later versus, you know, three days later. And then they're like, Hey, why aren't we closing? It's like, you know, we've been asking you for these, you know, the comp data or some doc or whatever. So anyway, just the more organized, the better. I mean, that, that kind of goes across the board, but it's, it's huge. And it, it's such a time sensitive industry that we're in. Yeah. Yeah, that is, and and I, and I say those things, and I brought up those things because I was guilty of it for a long time, you know, and and just how much better the the business operates when you treat it like a true business, and how that feels because it does give you the the confidence. I think when I operated the other way, it was hustle, hustle, hustle. I wasted a lot of energy and time and lost money where I could have made money. Right. You know, not not losing money on deals, but losing out on deals because I was busy dealing with stuff because of the the uh, you know the structure of the business wasn't where it could be. And we eventually got through that and learned from it. But if you can 
can do that early on better because, you know, you might say, well, I'll wait till I'm doing really well to, to do that kind of thing. It doesn't typically work like that. You know, it's kind of right. like, as soon as I make a million dollars, I'll give away 10%. And it's like, no, no, you won't. Like if you won't give 10% of what you got now, you're probably not going to give 10% later. But, um, you know, I do want to say another thing that you had brought up was the the story of the deals. Uh, I think that's a brilliant idea. I love that idea. And we did that early on for some when we were looking at getting some new private lenders and some, using some other uh, lenders. And I like looking back at those because it's like of all the hundreds of other deals that were done, I don't remember a thing about them, you know, but those that, that had a little thing written about them and had some pictures of before and after and all that kind of stuff. It's really cool to go back and look and see like, hey, you know, I remember this house. I remember we did this. And um, and then there's some other investors too. I, I remember years ago, I was I was making an offer on a property I really wanted to buy uh, as a rehab. And the seller um, had, had, you know, showed me that this other investor was wanting to buy that house as well. And he had left behind like a binder of all these before and afters and all this stuff. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. You know, it's not something that she gets to keep, but, you know, she definitely, you could tell that she was like, you know, wanting to to sell to this guy because he led her into his life and what he's doing with this whole thing. And it was, it was really interesting. It was fascinating. You know, I never got around to where I did that kind of thing, but you know, it's kind of cool to have that kind of thing because it also does help you show like, this is, you know, I, I you know, just for the same reasons you guys want to see it for the lending, you know, sellers sometimes want to see that because they, they don't know who you are or whether you're going to be able to do what you say you're going to do. So you're just having things already prepared to be able to prove that you can, you know, so that people can trust you, right? No, absolutely. I'm actually in the process of, of building a, a personal website. And that's one of the things I'm, I have not, I, I have a list, um, like a Word document list of past projects with what I described, you know, kind of the buy, the sell, the rehab, and a, in a paragraph in the story, but I'm going to have it there. And um, I mean, that is a huge nugget to be able to, this is, it makes me think of, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with Dan Kennedy. Yeah. So yeah. he had this, you know, he has this concept, you know, years and years ago about the shock and awe package. And, you know, so you just described the shock and awe, you go sit down, you get two investors, sit down with the seller. One's just kind of winging it. And one has this package that say, and they flip through and say, well, this is kind of what I was thinking with your house. And this is why I can, you know, quote unquote, pay more for your house because we do such a good job. And, you know, you, they, you connect them to kind of your, your, almost your business model to where they, you know, they're going to try and figure out a way to do, you know, work with you because they know you're a, a, a professional versus the other guy, even though he may be a professional, it looks like he's just kind of winging it. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's what, with a lot of things in business, right? I mean, if you're doing direct mail or anything, you know, you consider what people get and typically, you know, I know for, for some of the properties that I own, I get mail from investors and I swear, I mean, it's always the same stuff. It's the same stuff, the ease of use kind of thing where they're letting deal machine do their, their postcard. So it all looks like all the other ones I got, you know, and it's just kind of like, you know, the, the, who's the one that, I know I'm not a motivated seller at this point, you know, for, for anything, but you know, you know, I'm seeing what a seller is going to see. And if, if you have one that stands out above all those other ones, you know, it's going to stand out a lot because there's, there's just, so, so it doesn't take a whole lot to stand out, but so um, true. yeah. So how, how I know we've kind of talked about this. I don't know if you have any nug other nuggets about, you know, how to think like a lender and uh, underwrite deals accordingly. I don't know if you have anything to add. From, from what's already been said here. Yeah. I mean, not to get into the, like the weeds of kind of the loan to cost, loan to values and all that, that stuff. I mean, um, every lender's a little bit different. Um, obviously the, the as is, is, is important. The as is value. And then, you know, we're kind of dictating the max loan amount based on the, the after repair value incorporating, you know, the, the cost to fix it up. Um, so, you know, I, one other thing, you know, I, tell people a lot of times, you know, don't leave it for chance. If, you know, I assume that most investors know their markets relatively well, and, you know, they've, they've determined what they think their exit's going to be, you know, based on a certain value, you know, give your lender those comps, you know, tell them, look, you know, two, two streets away, you know, they're getting this number, but, 
this is actually a more true comp because this street has less traffic, blah, 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 you know, kind of tell that story. So, you know, you don't hand it over. I mean, we do, we, we get a appraisal on every file, but we will fund without an appraisal. We have an internal valuations team and, you know, there no appraisers perfect. Our internal valuations team isn't perfect. I mean, in most cases, you know, we know California pretty well, definitely Southern Cal, but there's definitely markets where, you know, we don't know the little intricacies of, of the, you know, various neighborhoods and streets and whatnot. And so again, tell the story, you know, just explain why you think you can get, you know, whatever, 5% more on your exit than, than the, you know, kind of the average comp. Um, the other thing is that that's happening, you know, just, I think kind of industry wide. And again, it's based on trend. We touched on this before, but just leverage. And I have a book, uh, handy it's like the real estate titans or something and it 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 uh it's not really an interview format but it's kind of like you know they they went out and kind of met with and talked to some of these top you know real estate uh ballers throughout the world actually there's some you know a handful of international markets and it was interesting in and i would say at least maybe 80 percent of the cases one of their their pieces of advice or one of their nuggets was, was leverage, like low leverage. And it was kind of interesting to read that. And again, these are larger development, you know, mostly commercial or, you know, hotels and stuff like that. But I think it, it translates to our business as well, more on the fix and flip and, and ground up construction side. And I'm totally guilty of it. So I'm not saying that I did it any different than, you know, kind of the average, but because I was focused on, you know, max leverage, you know, lowest pricing. And so I think um, I got into, you know, some challenging projects that took longer, cost more, like we we all have. And when you're extremely high leverage, you have much, you know, you have less options. You almost get to a point where you're not really in control of your deal. Mm. And so I, you know, as just a, you know, either a suggestion or recommendation to some folks is, you know, don't focus on, you know, getting max leverage in all cases. And I think it's it's almost as easy to go out. It doesn't seem like it, but it's almost as easy to go out and get, you know, more um, if you're not using your own cash anyway, to go out and get, you know, equity investors to come in to kind of make up the difference. And, you know, it, everyone structures their deals a different way. But um, I think given the market and just, I think, a, kind of a smart way to do business and Again, you know, hearing from some of the top real estate operators, you know, in the world, um, I guess they would suggest go low leverage. But I'm just saying, you know, think about how high you want to go on your leverage, because, I, you know, if you run into challenges, it's always, you know, it's always better to um, to not have a bank kind of, you know, coming down your street and wanting uh, wanting the property back. Right. Yeah. And I, I think a lot about what I heard a lot of happening back in, in 2008 and the term for that, that I, that stuck with me forever. And as soon as I hear high leverage, I just think of this term and it's domino, you know, the, the people that experienced some problems ended up in high leverage and everything dominoed and they lose everything. Right. Because there's, there's not, um, there's, there's not a strategy to how they're doing that to keep them a little bit less risky. Right. And, you know, there's reasons to leverage, you know, the cost of money, all that kind of stuff, inflation, making it actually cheaper to buy a house, you know, nowadays than, than it would have been to pay for back in 88. I don't know. I've seen calculations like that and all that kind of stuff because of inflation. But um, but as far as the whole leveraging side of it, to, to that extent, the, there's a local investor, Mitch Stevens, and he always talked about this moat theory where he had his core investments or his core things to keep his family and everything financially stable. And he never would ever use any of that for leverage or anything like that, leverage any of that, you know, it was like, and then he could do the other stuff and then he would leverage off of all the other things and, and do those things. But he kept that core always there. If that makes sense. Yeah. That's smart. And, and I think that that there should be some mix of that for everybody, right? Like always kind, kind of playing it safe, but but also taking some risk, but but doing it in a way that's structured and you know you know what you're getting into. If worst case scenario, 
you know, this is what could happen, but I'm okay with that. Right. You know, if worst case is you get wiped out, you're probably not okay with that, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's another thing that I, I think I probably have a, one of my quick tip videos was on, you know, looking at the downside, like, you know, looking at the significant downside, like what are your options? And that was, um, you know, that was one of the, the lessons learned that, you know, I wish I would have been talking to some land developers way back when, but um, that was a, a big lesson learned for me. You know, it's like when the market turns and you got a bunch of, you know, either raw or even titled land, I mean, man, it it's almost valueless because yeah. you got, you know, finished, you know, finished lots ready to build that are selling for, you know, less than what you're in your, you know, your paper lots. Yeah crazy stuff man I, I think we've got to go ahead and we're we're at about time so we're going to close this out do you have any last advice to anybody that's that's uh, looking to get some uh, some funding for their deals right now yeah and i feel i feel like i've said this like almost every comment i've made is you know i've i've made this mistake but um i would just also recommend not solely focusing on it seems funny coming from a lender obviously i'm 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 uh it's not like I'm trying to sell you, but don't focus on points and, um, you know, and pricing. Um, everyone's just like, what's your rate? What's your rate? What's your rate? And frankly, I, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, how, how experienced is this guy? Is he so focused on rate? Because, you know, things like fund control and, you know, the terms and all the other things that make up, uh, you know, kind of debt financing can become major. And, the reason I bring up fund control is because I've had situations where it literally would take me weeks to get my, my money, my, my rehab funds or my construction money. And in some cases it really slowed down a project. And then, you know, especially if we're in this, you know, whatever we're in this downward trend shifting market, I mean, that could just be a killer if you, you know, you got five or 10 draws and, you know, one lenders, you know, given you your money in three to five days and the other one's two weeks. I mean, you know, you add a couple months to a project and it's like, you could just totally miss the market. So anyway, that's kind of my, my parting advice is, you know, obviously rates and points are, are, are key. Leverage is key. Um, you know, it, you're trying to reduce your overall cost of doing the project. And that's, you know, those are a couple major ones, but um, it's also time. Time is, time is huge. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate you sharing all of, of what you've shared on, on this episode for everybody listening and, and uh, some great information uh, for anybody, even if, if lending isn't something you're looking for right now. I think there was a lot shared with you know, setting up your business so that in the future you're prepared and, and uh, you're going to look pretty good to those underwriters and, and all that kind of stuff. So I appreciate it. If anybody's looking to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, so my... Um... I mean, my cell, you know, text, I'm, I kind of live on my, my cell phone. So I, I don't mind, you know, sharing that it's 408-568-6875. Um, the, I have the uh, optimized real estate podcast um, primarily on YouTube in the process of actually, you could find a, a handful or two on, on Spotify. Um, and then what else? I'm not really the the uh the social uh beast that some guys are online but uh yeah i you definitely don't have find... a huge tiktok following <laughs> <laughs> yeah my my daughter's uh you know slowly educating me on on that it's amazing actually i'm surprised how many guys are on tiktok but there it's yeah, it's becoming I mean, more of a thing i don't know i don't want to have anything to do with it um <laughs> so yeah and then my website and my actually my personal email is rod at rod wilson.com so they could always uh, just shoot me an email and then um my personal website that i had mentioned is probably a week or two away from from fully launching which is uh rod dash wilson.com or rod hyphen wilson nice all right well i appreciate it and i do want to say in in closing that I, I probably get requests weekly from different lenders to be on the podcast. And, and I, I, I pretty much, I just do, I just delete most of them. Cause I mean, it's, it's just, you know, there, there it's just, I want to be on your podcast and that's it. And I don't, I don't remember what our communications were, but, but something about yours seemed different. And then our conversations that we've had, you know, 
had me want you to come on and, and, and just really was looking forward to you coming on this show. So I just want to say that because I think other people out there, you know, when you're talking to um, different lenders and sometimes it can just be all business and like, there's no relationship, but I feel like with you, people talking with you, are going to feel some sort of, you know, relationship being built. And, and that's the reason why I've got you on the show. And so I just wanted to say that. No, I, Danny, I really appreciate you having me on. In fact, um, the podcast that we did, you did, you know, I inter me interviewing you is going to be um, actually it's live on YouTube now, but that was, you know, some, some great content. And by the way, the little teaser is we talked about, you know, kind of um, systems before leads. And I think that's a, just a great topic for most people that, you know, they're so focused on, on leads, but then, you know, what are they actually doing with them? Mm -hmm. Um so I appreciate, you know, you, you taking the time and, and, you know, providing that kind of content to uh, my followers and, and clients and whatnot. But um, yeah, you're, you're a stud. I, you know, keep it up, keep all the, uh, the entrepreneurial, uh, you know, software products coming. Cause I think that's a, uh, that's a huge game changer uh, as far as, you know, doing this business well and, and, you know, profitably. All right, cool. And you called me a stud and, you know, we're not affiliates of each other. We're not pushing each other's products and making money off of it or anything like that. So I know it's a genuine statement, but uh, anyway, yeah, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, everybody, if you're, you're looking to, to get some lending, definitely check out uh, Rod and uh, give him a call and talk to him and see, see what can be done. All right. Sounds good. Thanks Rod. Have a good All one. All right. Thank you, Danny.